Good morning. My name is Gerhard Apfeltaler. I'm the Dean of the School of Management. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you here at this event and to introduce the President of the University, Dr. Chris Kimball. Thank you, Gerhard. Good morning, everybody. That was moderately enthusiastic. I hope you get more from them. Much better. Well, welcome to campus on this uh, beautiful morning. Is there anybody here who is a first time visitor to Cal Lutheran? Oh, wonderful. Well, special welcome. Be sure after the event is over to spend your afternoon wandering around getting acquainted with campus or come back on another time when it will be equally uh, beautiful. I just wanted to uh, say how much I appreciate the work, particularly led by uh, Dr. Vyman, to put this uh, event on, the second in the series. The university is in a couple of dimensions of the talent business. Obviously, on the one hand, we're all about trying to produce talented folks who come out and will work for you and to produce people who are ready to be effective in the workplace, ready to lead and, and be successful and develop in their careers as they unfold. But that requires us, on the other hand, to um, acquire talent among our faculty and our staff who can provide that nurturing and uh, leadership of our students. And I thought what I would do is talk about the fact that we have just approved a new strategic plan for the university. I have about 45 minutes. Um, okay, not really. <laughs> I'll just say this, though. The, the plan, in some ways, is undergirded by a couple of assumptions. Again, one is that we have to produce students, whether they're undergraduates coming with a bachelor's degree in one of the business disciplines, MBA grads or whatever, students that are prepared to function in a world that is global, a world that is changing, and that means that the campus has to continue to change, including being more inclusive of who it educates, where they come from, as well as where they go. Um, but that we also need to do that uh, in a way that is um, creative, innovative in which the culture really gives people the incentives to try new and different things. Uh, we're still kind of a startup at 50 plus years of age. Most universities are a lot older than that. Um, but especially where I sit now, 50 looks really young. But anyway, um, it's also very easy as we grow to become more rigid in our procedures and processes. Uh, and what we're trying to do is shift the culture and enhance those parts of the culture that are all about uh, change, flexibility, innovation, and creativity, because we think those are the things we need to be successful in higher education, and we think those are the things that people need in any industry, in any line of work. Um, predicting what lies ahead is difficult. I'm trained as a historian, so we're moderately good at looking backward and telling you what happened, in case you didn't already know. Um, looking forward, I think about the only thing we agree on is we don't know exactly what's going to happen for all of us and for all of our industries. And so what uh, the School of Management has done is really lead us in trying to think about how the university's culture needs to do an even better job of um, developing talent and building an organizational culture around that. And none of that would have happened uh, without the leadership that the School of Management's had over the years. Uh, Dean Emeritus Chuck Maxey is back there. Good morning, Chuck. And uh, he handed off a, a robust uh, school to Gerhard Opfeltaler, who has continued to put his foot to the uh, accelerator of what the school is doing and therefore what the university is doing. So this is a very timely series. Uh, as I say, we're grateful to Vlad for taking the lead in initiating it uh, and bringing his uh, worldwide expertise uh, to lead it, and to Gerhard for um, allowing Vlad the freedom to do that. So Gerhard, with that, let me welcome you back. So, oh, I was supposed to read your Vita? No. <laughs> welcome back the Dean, Gerhard Opfeltaler. Chris just pointed out that my tag is a little crooked. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, for your very kind words, and uh, especially also for your support, as much as you pointed out that I give Vlad the freedom, freedom to uh, do events like this. Uh, as you know, in academia, uh, uh, there's no 
uh, there, there's no chain of command really, right? So uh, I'm just trying to guide people and bring the best out of them. Um, but <laughs> thank you also for letting us do these things, of course. So Chris is a very strong supporter of the School of Management. And we're very grateful for that support. So since there are a number of you here who have never been to the university and who are probably not as familiar with uh, the, the university and the School of Management, let me just say a few words about us. The School of Management at Cal Lutheran is a community of approximately 1,400 students, undergraduate and graduate, about 10,000 alums worldwide. We have a, uh, an extraordinarily high degree of international students in our, in our graduate programs, which range from the traditional undergraduate business administration, accounting, and econ programs to the more specialized graduate programs uh, with flagship programs like the executive MBA program and specialized master's programs in public policy and in information technology, in quantitative economics, uh, and in financial planning. Um, we believe, or as a dean, I should say, I, I believe that we have a distinct culture of the School of Management, uh, which is built on the values of the university, but also built on values that we think our students will be able to leverage in their future business careers. We strongly believe in professionalism. We believe in integrity uh, of our students. We believe in an attitude of doing and helping others. And so it is my hope that uh, the university, the School of Management in particular, is actually helping in filling that challenging talent pipeline that we're going to uh, talk about uh, today. So without much further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Vlad Weiman, who is not only the organizer of this event, but with whom I have worked in several countries, actually, and in several capacities uh, globally. Uh, so I believe we're really a, a, a great, great team that makes things happen. Lad Weimann. Wow. Thank you very much and good morning. Uh, we just wanted to make this a little cozier, this room. That's why we kind of, you know, put a divider up. Um, and Normally, we plan for about 40 to 45 people for these events because we want to make sure that people have a uh, good networking opportunity, number one. And number two, um, an opportunity to um, do wonderful uh, roundtable discussion. And when you have 150 or 200 people, it's difficult to do. Uh, today, we had uh, how many people signed up? I know around 58 people. I couldn't say no to, you know to most, most people who asked to be here. <laughs> uh, therefore, we will have more people than planned, but this is good. Uh, hopefully, you know, all tables are more or less occupied. We'll have wonderful discussion later on. And <coughs> just wanted to let you know, uh, if you take a look at your uh, agendas, you will see that uh, after a couple of speeches, uh, we'll have a break. And um, then after the break, uh, we'll have uh, roundtable discussions and then uh, panel discussion, right? And um, I, I just wanted to make sure that everybody understands where we are. Please ask us questions. Uh, there's Susan, who I would like to thank, but I'll thank her later. Susan can, ask, uh, can answer all of your questions. She's one of the organizers. I can um, answer questions. So let's make it a little bit more informal more interactive and more informative, okay? So that's the first part. Second part, uh, I think it's also important to mention that you have pens on your tables. Uh, personally, I've thrown away a few of those because I thought they were not working. But apparently there's a little rubber tip at the end. <laughs> so before using one, please make sure that you remove. All right, that's just, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, part of my note. <laughs> um, wonderful. So what actually is in my notes is the introduction of our panelists. Uh, we are really lucky to 
have a wonderful panel of four extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily specialists and experts in the area of human resources, in the area of talent management, and uh, in the area of organiza uh, organizational culture. I'm going to introduce them to you right now, and then they will say a few words about themselves, uh, and perhaps um, also indicate a few questions or topics that they're interested in, uh, in the realm of our today's conversation, which is how to leverage organizational culture to attract and retain top talent. Let me start with uh, Doreen Hackey. And hold on, Doreen, I'm going to give you a microphone. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Doreen Hackey, and I love this topic because it exudes what I do. I work for multinational global organizations putting in systems, processes, and program that build global leaders to meet current and future needs. So that's a very complex process. So the image that I want you to think about as we go through the topic today and as you listen to the keynote presentations is a visual image of the relationship between the talent management strategy and the business strategy. So we often uh, relate that to the vertical. So the business strategy, the cascading down of goals so that all functional areas understand and are aligned with what that strategy should, should be for their various functional areas. And that's the relationship, it's key. But the second side of that equation, which we often don't think about, is the horizontal. So what's the infrastructure that needs to be put in place to support that. And if you want a super duper, supercharged strategy, you have to have the combination of both. So I spent most of my career on the East Coast with Big Pharma, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and decided I needed an industry change, so I left drugs and went to alcohol. <laughs> what a combination, right? <laughs> So I moved to Denver, lovely Denver with the Rockies, worked with Molson Coors, um, and had the responsibility of putting in this structure. So what I'd like to share with you just briefly is the highlight. So what I talked about, that vertical, that's the cascading of global objectives. Johnson & Johnson, $377 billion organization, with 125,000 employees. Just think about the massive structure. So I understand, and they lived it. They were the epitome of implementing this strategy from a cascading perspective. So as I sat in my respective uh, a business unit, so for those of you are, that aren't familiar with Johnson & Johnson, you've got the major corporate structure, but then you've got the three major divisions, consumer, pharmaceuticals, medical devices, and then over 250 businesses. So I sat in one of those 250 businesses. But as I was building that talent management structure, I was very clear and understood that I was building it for my business unit, but I also understood how it was relating to the overall corporate structure. Very, very powerful process. Having experienced that, then of course, you know, since I moved to alcohol, um, had the opportunity to put that in from scratch. So that's the challenge for everyone sitting in here today, I think, is how do we ensure that alignment is in place? And how do we identify what those benefits are? So hopefully I'll be able to share more of my experience. And uh, thank you for being here with me Thank today. You, Thank you, Doreen. Thank you. next a little bit. <clears throat> All right, my name, Brick, is not my given name. It is a hand-me-down, and it re represents the culture that I grew up in. My fascination with culture really began on the 28th of January, 1986, the very same day the Challenger exploded. It was my first day of deployment on the USS Enterprise, an aircraft carrier, and I was a fighter pilot. A hundred yards off to my left, I heard two explosions. I saw two forms go up in the air and immediately come down. Then I saw a parachute 
it was my first mishap, my first Navy mishap from 100 yards away. Both the pilot and the reel in the back of an F-14 got killed. As I would eventually learn and discover, I was in the most dangerous air wing in the modern history of the United States Navy, the most mishaps. At the end of that appointment, we had about eight, a really high number. And as we would learn from all those mishaps in the Challenger, the primal causal factor in all of those was their culture. So that set my tone for the fixation I had on developing cultures on the teams, the organizations, and the companies that I would leave to get it right. And that is, I think, what you all are here and endeavor to do every single day. It's a lot harder than it looks, and you can get it wrong, and it constantly has to keep with the times. The other question I ask myself every single day, and the most important, I think, uh, for talent uh, coming into an organization, whether they come at the entry level or more senior level, is in order to bind them to your culture, your values, you need to make them feel like they're part of that organization as soon as they step on board. So at the, the, the minimum duration possible, they need to feel valued, they need to be respected, they need to feel important, and they need to feel like they're adding something, they're contributing. And if you can't do that quickly, you can never bind them to your culture. And so that's the other thing that I've learned in my experience, both as a, a Navy fighter pilot, a uh, military officer, and in retirement, a, uh, a, a CEO and a, and a, and a business uh, executive. Those are the things that uh, I, I think all of you struggle with every day because you constantly are faced with labor issues, with talent issues, and how to get them all aligned, moving forward in the right direction. And hopefully I can provide some of my inputs through the, the course of the day and help you with that. Thank you very much. Uh, Jim Cathcart, please. Hello, my name is Jim Cathcart. I am the HR director at the Four Seasons Westlake Village. Who's been to the Four Seasons Westlake Village? <laughs> Yes, thank you. We're remodeling next year. There's going to be new stuff you can come see. Uh, uh, 600 people work there. I grew up with Four Seasons. I started in Santa Barbara at the Biltmore. Who's been to Sunday brunch at the Biltmore? OK, gotcha. Eight years there, and then I opened up this place all by myself. No, just kidding. Uh, and it's 11 years in Westlake Village, so 19 years. I know one culture. I worked for one hotel chain, and that's it. Um, I hear about other cultures from people who leave Four Seasons, resign, and then six months later say, I've made a horrible mistake, can I please come back? And then they tell me what they've experienced. So I can talk to that you know, secondhand, but I just really know one culture. My topic is um, how do you build and maintain a cohesive culture with a diverse population? Because we have administrative assistants who work Monday through Friday, nine to five jobs, and we have dishwashers who, and overnight cleaners and all sorts of people from different backgrounds. And how do you get them all singing off the same song sheet? And so that's what we'll be talking about today at my table. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Bob Bushnell. Good morning. My name is Bob Bushnell. I am a uh, proud alumnus of the Cal Lutheran MBA program. Uh, I've also uh, just recently retired from a 33-year career in the aerospace and defense industry. Um, I spent many years with Hughes Aircraft Company, which was later acquired by Raytheon. I don't know if uh, any or many of you are familiar with the aerospace culture, but uh, um, there are different cultures within the aerospace industry. Obviously, it's a very large industry, but um, at the 50,000-foot level, we say there's the East Coast culture and there's the West Coast culture. A lot of aviation was developed here on the West Coast, nice weather. Some of the early aviation pioneers came out here, formed some really amazing companies. Lockheed Martin was out, or Lockheed rather, was out here. Uh, Hughes Aircraft Company was one of the first. And um, it had a very proud culture. Um, it was a very collegial culture. Uh, the company for many years um, operated as a nonprofit believe it or not, even though it was extremely profitable. 
Um, <laughs> and, and, and as a result, the IRS at, uh, in, the, in the mid 80s determined that it would have to change its status and uh, the company was uh, sold uh, by a medical institution bought by General Motors and it became, uh, op from that point forward, it was operated as a, as a traditional business. Um, but the culture that had been created prior to that event was uh, one of collegiality. Um, they had a high regard for uh, academic achievement and te technological prowess uh, and sharing of ideas and, and uh, uh, you know, working together collegially. Um, on the East Coast, however, the, the culture was a little different. Um, they had some uh, very, very prominent, well-respected uh, aerospace companies. Grumman was out there. Uh, many others, Sikorsky was out there, many others. But they operated very, very differently. They operated in a more traditional sort of um, technology and manufacturing sort of mode. Um, it was, you know, shoulder to the wheel. You know, you do what the boss says. It was very hierarchical. And so you had um, a large group of people in our industry who grew up in that culture, and then you had a large group who grew up in the California culture. I'm a product of the California uh, culture. And so, but eventually, you know, after 89, uh, when the wall came down and everybody was, uh, well, the, the aerospace and defense industry was consolidating, what you had was you had the coming together of East Coast Coast companies. For example, you had Lockheed and Martin coming together. You had Northrop and Northrop, which was a California company, coming together with Grumman. You had Northrop Grumman. So you had all these, this, this, these cultures converging into these big monolithic companies. So you had many different cultures that had to be managed. So my last job in aerospace, one that I've just recently retired from, was as a group vice president for a company called L3. L3 was created 20 years ago when Lockheed and Martin came together, merged. Justice Department said, you are way too big in certain areas. So they had to spin off certain businesses within the collective. And a company, L3, Lehman was one of the L's, Lanza was another one, and then La Penta was the third. Um, Lanza was the longtime CEO of the company. Lehman was the investment banking company that pulled it all together, and La Penta was the uh, COO. Anyway, they created this company, L3, and they took all these companies that had been spun off by Lockheed and Martin, and they went out and they acquired many, many other companies. Today, it's a collection of over 100 companies. So imagine how many different cultures there are across that company, L3. I was a group vice president, so within my group we had many of those companies. And so my job as vice president of strategy and business development was to leverage the cultures within those many companies to produce the very best business results. Now we had divisions and companies all over the world. We have many in the United States, we have several in Canada, uh, several in the UK, several in Australia now, and we have um, marketing and business development offices all over the world. So it was always a challenge for me to work with those groups to make sure that the culture was n not only preserved, because each you know, started as an individual company, it had its own culture, but there was never any interest on the part of management in turning those cultures into this one monolithic L3 culture. We always saw the value in preserving the uh, founding culture and preserving the best of it and leveraging it to get the very best business results. So that's one of the things that I want to look at today. I'll, I'll just say quickly before I, I pass this on to the next speaker. One of the divisions in my group was, uh, is uh, Sonoma Electro Optical in Santa Rosa, California. So as the cost of doing business in California you know, increased, more and more of the manufacturing was um, sent away to other lower cost manufacturing areas in the country. Um, that was a, a blow to that business. Um, as you all know, Santa Rosa um, suffered in the last couple of weeks uh, with, these, uh, with these fires. Um, we, I learned yesterday that seven of our employees lost their homes. So you have a business here that 
for business reasons, was getting smaller and smaller. The population was getting smaller and smaller. The culture was kind of diluting. We were bringing people in from outside of Santa Rosa to help manage what was left of Santa Rosa. Now you have this fire situation. What do we do? You know, that's one of the things that I'm going to look at today is how you leverage management and how you leverage uh, talent to preserve the culture and to enhance the culture and to grow it and to get them through really hard times. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Marilyn Mo Monaghan. Would you please tell us about yourself? Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. So as the moderator, I don't have a topic. Instead, I get to ask the questions, which I like doing because I'm a lawyer by profession. So I like putting people on the spot. Um, so um, I'm actually, I specialize in employee benefits. Um, but uh, fortunately, my interests don't stop at employee benefits because that would be kind of boring. Um, so I like many areas of HR. And where my, um, how my interests really broadened is about 10 years ago, I uh, joined the board of the Professionals and Human Resources Association, PIRA, which is um, a volunteer, um, voluntary membership association for human resources professionals. It's the largest SHRM chapter in the country and it operates in about five um, counties um, locally. And um, so that's why through the education that I received there, through talking lots and lots and lots with HR professionals, not only in my day job, but through my volunteer work, as well as in my job as immediate past president and president of PIRA um, and serving on the management committee for many years helping with our own staff issues. And uh, we have a small staff, but there's still a culture, there's still recruiting, and there's still talent management and various uh, things such as that. So I'm very pleased to be here in this capacity. And I also want to mention that um, our current president, Patty Sprinkle, is here as well. And um, Karen Bubnitz, who is our uh, chair of our Woodland Hills District. And um, I'm mentioning them also because Cal Lutheran just started a Pyra student chapter, and we're very excited about this. And these are the people they'll be working with. And our, some of the students and faculty advisors are here today. So I'm very pleased about that. Thank you very much. All right, so here's what I want to do right now. Right now, I would like to set the scene for our conversations further and for the keynote speech uh, by Dina Barmasi Gray, who will introduce later. Um, by setting the scene, I would like to show you what the world of academia is saying about organization culture and about talent management and how to leverage organization culture to um, attract and retain best employees. Uh, also, I would like to show you some definitions with which we'll work today and just give you general understanding of uh, what practice, uh, sorry, what theory and uh, academia says about this topic and provide perhaps with some general, again, the key word is general, tips on how to be successful when you t uh, put together organizational culture and talent management, okay? So he, these are my expectations. So hopefully we'll be able to be on the same page at least when we go to our keynote speech and then to our roundtable discussions, okay? Does it sound okay to you? All right, so I'll uh, briefly touch upon organizational culture and its definitions, then the same thing about talent and talent management. And then we'll talk about organizational culture and talent management together. And uh, more specifically, a few strategies on how to leverage that organizational culture to attract and retain your top talent. If you have any questions, perhaps you can ask them later. <laughs> <laughs> During our, type, uh, during our discussions and uh, panel uh, discussion as well, uh, just for the sake of time. However, if you feel during my presentation, if you feel that you need to ask something right away, please don't hesitate. All right, so let's talk about organizational culture. In general, if you look at any textbook or any uh, professional article, you will see that organizational culture really is a set of shared value, uh, values, 
norms and assumptions that guide members' attitudes and behaviors. Okay? Again, set of shared values, norms, and assumptions that guide employees' behavior if you translate it into uh, the organization language. Organization culture consists of four major parts. Artifacts, which are physical manifestation uh, of culture that includes offices, you know, open or closed uh, cubicles or open space or, you know, whatever. Different awards, ceremonies, uh, formal values, and many, many other things. Espoused values and norms, uh, basically the chain of command and the reporting relationship in the organization. Number two. Number three, enacted values and norms, uh, basically what those values and norms that employees exhibit in their everyday behavior, as well as different assumptions. Uh, those are sometimes subconscious if you've been working for a company for a long time and you don't even notice them. And uh, those uh, values are becoming so ingrained into your organizational memory uh, that they become, you know, at the core of company's uh, culture. And basically that's how you can look at it. I, don't, I know that in, in many uh, areas of uh, knowledge they, they like to use the iceberg uh, picture, but this is actually what it's for. Uh, you have your artifacts above the water level, and then you know below the water level you have some espoused uh, beliefs and values and basic assumptions at the very end uh, or at the very bottom because you don't of them you don't notice them until somebody points it out to you you know so that's what it, what it, what what it looks like now organizational culture does matter you know i, I know that i'm preaching to the converted really uh, <laughs> but it does matter because uh, it does boost organizational performance. And it does so only and only if the organizational culture is strategically relevant, A, B is strong, and C, it emphasizes flexibility in organizational culture while at the same time um, embracing innovation and change. Those things are, you know, can be thought of something m like mutually uh, exclusive, but they're not. Think about it, right? On the one side, you want to have a strong culture, but on the other side, you want to have it flexible. And you have to make sure that you kind of marry those two things. All right. You will ask me, so what? Right? Well, I'll tell you, so what? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, actively managing organizational culture improves organization's competitive advantage and also performance only when it supports business strategy, again, when it's strong, and it also enables innovation and change while at the same time remaining flexible enough uh, to change. Uh, there are no, there is, uh, I should say, no such thing as one best case scenario or one best um, solution for every company because uh, organizational culture depends on many things. It depends uh, by, uh, sorry, it depends on the industry, right, in which industry you work. It, it's influenced by national culture, where the company is located and operating, and it's also influenced by companies' founders and or leaders, of course. However, Leaders can influence organizational culture, and I'm sure that we'll touch upon those things today during our panel discussion and roundtable discussions as well. Uh, leaders can influence uh, organizational culture by developing a clear sense of mission and values, uh, what the company should stand for, what it should be like, uh, by selecting employees who can share those values. That's why right now companies uh, Hire for fit rather than for skills, right? Skills, is, skills are important, but first and foremost, you need to fit into that organizational culture. Uh, espouse those values and norms. Walk the walk, walk the talk, <coughs> right? Be a leader and show by example. Consistently role model behaviors that reinforce your organizational culture. Make your HR procedures and criteria consistent 
on a daily basis. And of course, nurture the old traditions that, has, that have proven to work over time. Okay, so that's in regard to organization culture. Are, are we still on the same page? <coughs> Everybody's still awake? <laughs> Very good. So-so? My dean says so-so, but you know. Uh, talent, uh, just a brief refresher for those of you who haven't attended our last year's forum. And as President Kibble said, this is the second. Uh, last one was dedicated to the millennials. This one is to organization culture. Next year we'll do something else, right? Are you on? Yes. On board, I mean? <laughs> Don't forget. <laughs> All right, let's refresh ourselves a little bit, our memories in regards to talent. Uh, talent uh, is referred to um, as systematically developed innate ability of an individual or individuals that are deployed in activities that they like, find important, and in which they want to invest their energy, skills, and ability. We talk about talent as key people in critical jobs. And also those employees who possess and or are pursuing specialized and in-demand knowledge and skills. Okay, so you have your key positions in the company and then you have your key people. And when you can bring them together, that's what we mean by talent management. Taking talented people, putting them into key critical roles. And that's what I just said, right? Talent management is a aimed welcome, uh, at attracting, motivating, developing, and retaining organizational s uh, organizations most valuable employees that ensure their deployment in those roles that matter and that provide greatest value to the organization. There are some, by the way, I'm sorry, there are some spots available here by the table. Please join us. Okay. Are we clear on talent management? All on the same page. Huh. There's an interesting question we haven't covered last time. Talent management is usually of two kinds, exclusive and inclusive. Inclusive is when all employees are kind of considered talent in the company and subject to different developmental activities, <coughs> uh, obviously on a voluntary basis. You cannot or should not develop anybody who doesn't want to be developed. <laughs> That's inclusive, right? Exclusive refers to efforts aimed only at key uh, employees in key positions. And here's a provocative question for all of you. Which one is better? I'd like to ask those questions. Which one is better? Oh. Both. Any other responses? Well, you know, it's 50-50, really. <laughs> there are three answers. A, B, or both. <laughs> or <neither>. Four <laughs> answers. <laughs> well, you know, there are many considerations, including, of course, cultural considerations, because in more egalitarian societies, like, for example, in Scandinavian countries, they prefer not to distinguish best employees or best talent, because everybody is kind of equal, right? Um, ethical considerations, because no one should be left behind. There are financial considerations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, from a purely moral standpoint, perhaps, talent management should be all-inclusive. No doubt about it. However, no company has unlimited... Therefore, no company that I know of, at least, can allow themselves to develop and spend money, resources, on all the employees. So they need to pick and choose. Most organizations use exclusive approach, okay, only for scarcity of resources reasons. And we can talk about it later, but that's really what it's like. Another question that people ask me very often, what is the difference between talent management and human resource management? Is it just this different word for the same kind of thing? You know, we've been through personnel management, right? Strategic human resources management. We've been through many, many different monikers. The question is, is there a difference? And I'll tell you, there is. That's why talent management in academia, at least, has kind of crystallized into completely different um, 
but related area. <laughs> so what are the differences? I'm not going to uh, list all of them, but at least the most important ones. Uh, talent management moves human resources agenda in general beyond HR function itself into the boardrooms. And our keynote speaker will also tell you that today, hopefully, that if there is no support by top management, talent management is not going to fly. HR will still be there, but talent management is not going to fly. Number one. Number two, there is greater, greater differentiation of HR practices to support employees' needs. And talent management, again, has a narrower focus than human resource management because it's mostly, as we just learned, uh, targeted at employees with high level of human capital and not necessarily all employees in the organization. Again, preaching to the converted. For most companies, identifying, attracting, and retaining talented high-value employees in key roles and positions has increased in importance in the past perhaps 10 years. Uh, most recent PwC Global CEO survey, Global, uh, reports that talent management remains the number one priority for 78% of companies worldwide. 78% of companies worldwide. Look at this chart. I'm not sure if you can uh, see what's written there, but I can tell you. Um, on the vertical axis, you have uh, future importance, low to high. On the horizontal, current capability from high to low. And if you look at low current capability and high future importance in the right hand upper quadrant, you will see the talent management sits as number one. Improving leadership develop development is number two. Measuring uh, workforce performance, number three. You know, HR analytics, in other words. That's what CEOs say executives globally. U.S. HR professionals more or less say the same things. Say the same things. Number one challenge, retaining and rewarding best employees. Number two challenge, developing next generation of corporate leaders. Number three, creating corporate culture. Ah, okay, now we're starting to kind of weave in corporate culture here. Creating corporate, cult corporate culture that attracts the best employees basically are becoming becoming an employer of choice. Okay, so now, trying to put together those two, talent management and organizational culture. In order to take advantage of your organizational culture and really attract, develop, retain best employees, you need to ask yourselves, you as companies, leaders, HR leaders, whatever, uh, you need to ask yourselves those five hard questions about soft side of business. Question number one, is your talent strategy rooted in your business strategy? And that's what Doreen was talking about in the beginning. What's the relationship there? Because culture is not just an assortment of well-meaning practices. It's not a laundry list of what we want to be. Building a great culture starts with total clarity among all the levels of the organization about what the organization stands for and how you expect to win. And there could be no meaningful talent strategy, obviously, if you don't have a compelling and strong business strategy. Question number two, does your company work as distinctive, distinctively as it competes? Research shows that most successful organizations in, in general, they care more. They care more about their people, care more about their tasks, care more about the outcomes. Just care more. And it's reflected in their organizational culture. If you want to energize and elevate how your organization performs, how it competes, you have to energize, energize and elevate how your people behave. Okay, question number three, can you capture what it means to be a member of your organization? And that's one of the questions that we're going to discuss today. It's important to create a sense of community in the organization. 
Look at the Texas uh, A&M University's culture. From, outside, from the outside looking in, you can't understand it. From inside looking out, you can't explain it. <laughs> right? Let it sink in, sink in a little bit. Is it making sense to you? For the employees, it's just how it's supposed to be. Even though people from the outside may not understand it. Question number four. Is your culture built for learning as well as performance? Again, that's about that adaptability, flexibility in your organizational culture that will allow you to A, perform better, and B, adapt to environmental changes. That's why it says here, the best cultures and the most effective leaders keep learning as fast as the world is changing, while still maintaining those main values intact. Last question. Can your culture maintain its zest for change and renewal even when the company is in trouble a little bit? Resiliency is the key word here. Most enduring cultures are the most resilient ones. Look at Southwest Airlines, for example. Don't look at United, but look at Southwest Airlines, right? Think of its business case, and you'll understand 100% what I'm talking about. So what should organizations do, really? Again, I'm providing some general understanding of what it's like in the world of academia and what practitioners also agree with. Create and maintain strong organizational culture that supports meaningful talent management strategies. At the same time, create and maintain meaningful talent management strategies that are embedded in strong organizational culture. Well said. Is it easy to do? No. How do we do it? That's a separate question. And the last part of my presentation. I don't want to take too much time uh, because I'm also looking forward to our main keynote speech. Um, so briefly, again, repeating myself from uh, actually last year and also from today a little bit, uh, talent management activities revolve around the following uh, 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 around the following activities. Attracting talent, developing talent, uh, ma managing talent flows, you know, across borders sometimes, and ensuring retention of talented employees. So that's what we uh, decided to call talent management. Now, let's briefly talk about each of those things in, in, in turn, except for uh, talent flows. We're not going to touch upon this today because we're not really talking about necessarily international organizations today. Three fields of importance to consider when attracting talent. Number one, talent planning and development. Number two, developing employer branding. And number three, aggressive talent sourcing. Not just talent sourcing, but aggressive talent sourcing. Interesting, huh? So planning and development is quite easy to understand. By the way, I know I'm rushing a little bit, uh, but I will make those slides available if you're interested. The role of planning and development, obviously, to identify future talent needs at all levels of the organization. The goal of talent planning and deployment is to have the right talent at the right place at the right time. And main concern is to retain current level of talent, but more importantly, attract new talent. That's easy to understand. Employer branding, that's exactly what we're talking about today. One of the uh, uh, one of the factors that we are going to discuss today as part of attra attraction. Organizations have to focus on characteristics that make themselves more attractive to a pool of potential applicants. Applicants, it should say, not potential applicant. Pool of potential applicant doesn't sound right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, also, it's important to view, for those of you in charge, uh, it's important to view your employer brand as a marketing function. That's, you know, a very interesting thing. And I see many people are nodding. Yes, it's important to see it as a marketing function and treat potential applicants as customers. Identify and analyze your competitors. Focus on organizational characteristics that matter the most to different types of recruits. Is it easy to do? No. Does it take time? Yes. 
organization culture <laughs> plays the most essential role here. Even during the recession or economic downturn, organizations can focus on building uh, your human resource reputation or employer branding and attractiveness of a company as an employer of choice. Right? And uh, I provide an example uh, saying that organizations can effectively use performance management practices to identify talent, redesign jobs, or restructure work to motivate and engage employees. And I think one of our uh, participants uh, today, uh, Primo Custodio, who just recently retired from uh, being a vice president of, for human resources and operations of NBC Universal Comcast, uh, he can tell you how he's done it through six mergers and acquisitions. <laughs> right, Primo? It was not easy. <laughs> uh, lastly, aggressive talent sourcing. Uh, you know, there's general assumption, of course, right now, you know, that uh, talented individuals are always employed, so it's difficult to really get hold of them and pouch them, uh, you know, take them into another organization. So traditional sourcing strategies do not or may not work all the time. Um, organizations nowadays are, you know, I have to say, they're forced to use creative and aggressive strategies to attract talent, such as targeting uh, specific individual profiles, right? Targeting and recruiting uh, people from abroad, tapping into international markets, attracting a diverse pool of applicants, such as, for example, female employees, and providing support to them to manage their career be uh, better, you know, in breaking glass ceiling and many other um, areas. Uh, I'm not going to talk about talent development right now. Uh, however, you need to understand, which you do, I'm sure, that um, talent development is very much connected with talent attraction and retention. Because if you don't develop your talent, they will just leave you, right? Because becoming uh, someone, because career progression, because uh, their career growth potential makes or breaks the employee in your organization. Um, retaining, last time we looked at major workforce trends, and one of them uh, was changing attitude of employees towards work. And, you know, if you look at millennials specifically, you will see that employees at all levels change jobs more often, more and more often. So <clears throat> retaining talent becomes a major challenge for, organi for all organizations. And I'm not only talking about millennials, in general. Whatever you do, ladies and gentlemen, whatever you, you know, you, you try your best, people will still leave you, right? People will be leaving you, not because you're bad, but because they found something more interesting, something better, something that provides more developmental, perhaps, opportunities for them. Who knows? They will leave. So that's the main assumption you need to, you need to stick to, I think. So uh, one perspective on talent management is that in today's world, when people change jobs all the time, when people shift from company to company, you need to extract as much talent uh, from them, from those talented employees, as possible in the shortest period of time. Would you agree? So what does it mean, really? It means that we need to retain this talent through few important strategies, such as talent engagement. And uh, uh, during our keynote speech, main keynote speech, we'll, we'll touch upon this, I'm sure. Uh, employees who are more engaged with their work and organization are likely to have greater job satisfaction, less likely to leave uh, their company voluntarily, etc., etc., etc. Provide more training and development. We just talked about it. Um, and, of course, create and maintain the talent, the talent management culture, which is a part of your organizational culture, right? Show your employees that talent management is a priority for all employees. Try to source talent globally and reward managers for improving talent retention. In how many companies do you think managers are measured on how well they retain people? Do you think it's a high percentage or low percentage? Five to seven percent. Unfortunately. So lastly, 
what can organizations do? And now we'll hear from uh, Dina uh, in regards to one of those organizations. Make more uh, work more meaningful and design work that's interesting and challenging. Help people f uh, feel important and valued. Establish or reestablish trust if necessary. Train leaders and managers to be supportive. Provide authentic recognition. Again, make sure that your strategy is fo fo always focused on growth and development. And more importantly, create an environment that links performance of the organization to values and desired behaviors. This is the key. Again, create an environment that links performance to companies, values, and desired behaviors. And that, ladies and gentlemen, will become your most powerful tool to, to um, attract and retain top talent. That's all from me. Thank you, first of all. Yes, Jim, you can. Yeah. Um, we'll discuss questions later, perhaps, if you have any. But now I'm really looking forward and thrilled to introduce to you our main keynote speaker, uh, Dina Barmasi Gray, who is the Senior Vice President for Human Resources for the Cheesecake Factory. Some of you may, may have heard of this company, right? <laughs> uh, by the way, named one of the Fortune 100 best companies to work for, for e uh, in each of the f past four years, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, before joining the Cheesecake Factory, Dina was Corporate Human Resource Vice President, President at Thomson Technicolor. And prior to that, she spent her career with the Boeing Company, uh, last as the Human Resource Division Director for Rocketdyne. Again, the company most of you might have. No, uh, might have heard and known. Uh, Dina holds a Master of Science in Organization Development from Pepperdine. <laughs> <laughs> as well as a bachelor's uh, degree in industrial psychology from Cal State uh, Northridge, from CSUN as we call it, right? Uh, she's been honored for the, uh, as the Ventura County NHRA HR Executive of the Year. Uh, she is a board member for the Cancer Support Community, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing free emotional support, education, and hope for people with cancer, as well as their loved ones. And she's also a member of the Senior Human Resource Foundation. And it's my thrill and extreme privilege to welcome Dina Barmasi Gray. Does it work? Of course. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, hello, everybody. You know, I have to say, I woke up this morning, I'm a little nervous, can I tell you? And I, it's not actually what you might think, although I hope I do a very good job for you today. <laughs> it wasn't about coming here today. I had the same nervous feeling yesterday. Because as a lifelong Dodger fan, I <laughs> <laughs> going to work. Oh, today has to be the day, right? But I'm going to focus, focus, focus for the next few uh, minutes that we have time to spend together. It is my pleasure to be able to talk to you today about uh, the Cheesecake Factory and a little bit more about what we do and how really the culture of the Cheesecake Factory is foundational for absolutely everything that we do. Um, if I, I hope that many of you, and I think many of you may know a little bit about us, but um, just to give you a little background, Oscar and Evelyn Overton are the people you're looking at right here, and they have a tradition of excellence that started back in the 50s in Detroit, where Evelyn took a cheesecake recipe from a newspaper, tinkered with it a little bit, and continued to find people who just couldn't get enough of her cheesecakes. And so they decided that this might be worthwhile to make a business out of, and so they decided to move from Detroit, come out to Southern California, and try to sell her cheesecakes. And they did that, and they, quite frankly, they were kind of floundering for a while. And their son, David Overton, was going to school up in Northern California, and he was being a drummer, and had nothing to do with cheesecakes or anything else. But he thought, you know what, I need to help my parents out. I need to go now and I need to open up a restaurant so I can showcase their cheesecakes. He knew nothing about restaurants. He had never worked at a restaurant, didn't know anything about restaurants, but he said, this is what I got to do. So he came down and they op he opened the first cheesecake factory in Beverly Hills. And uh, it, it was funny because, you know, he really, again, 
was trying to learn as he was going along, figuring things out. And as the day was about to, you know, come where they were going to be opening, etc., got a little nervous. Didn't think he was quite ready, so he put a sign out that said, "Open at two, because he kind of just wasn't ready to open when he thought. Went out about 1:50, opened the door, and there was a line around the block. He will tell you, and. He doesn't know why there was a line around the block, but we're very fortunate. We always joke that the line hasn't, hasn't stopped still. And we're very fortunate to be able to enjoy, you know, really a strong reputation that keeps people coming back. Um, and I don't know, how many of you have been to Cheesecake Factories? Have many? Well, let me ask it the other way. Has anybody not been to a Cheesecake Factory? Okay, okay, well, good. Okay. Well, that makes me very happy. But uh, if for those of you that, have, even if for those of you that have been here, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about what a typical day is like. Like in one of our restaurants. It's a lot, you know. When you when you think about restaurants, we really it's hard to think of another restaurant that is more complex than the Cheesecake Factory, with the menu size that we have and the volume that we have. So we'll talk a little bit today about what does that mean for us as you know, trying to keep the talent in place. Just to give you a little bit more background about the Cheesecake Factory, we have um, about 210 restaurants right now worldwide. Um, most of them, uh, are 210 in the U.S., and that's where we're obviously um, mostly based. Um, we have the Cheesecake Factory restaurants. Most of you know those. Grand Lux restaurants, we have 13 of those. So some of you might have uh, remember that when we had it at the Beverly Center, but we don't have one locally right now anymore. Um, and then Rock Sugar. Has anybody been to Rock Sugar? How great is Rock Sugar? Love Rock Sugar. I wish it was even a little closer. It's in Century City, and it's just so great. We're opening our second Rock Sugar in Chicago later this month, and uh, we're opening in Canada next month as well. And we have partners where we um, uh, work in other parts of the world. So in the Middle East, in uh, Latin America, and in Asia, we have partners that we work with. It took a long time for us to feel comfortable to be able to do that. But So we have about 40,000 employees um, uh, worldwide, and or, or just um, uh, in nationwide here. So a lot of people, a lot of people at Cheesecake Factory. And being a great business, obvious, or a great workplace, obviously means, hopefully, you're ha also being a great business. And we do lead the industry in some of the key measures that you might look at. So we deliver the highest average uni unit sales in our industry, more than $10 million. So each restaurant, basically, $10 million of sales per restaurant. And typically, in uh, you know casual dining, you might find something two to three million at the high end sometimes, so really much bigger than, than most other restaurants. Um, industry leading hourly staff and manageable retention, which we'll talk about. At the end of last year, we delivered comparable sales growth for 28 consecutive cu quarters and uh, had more than $300 million in operating cash flow. Um, obviously, all of these things require great people to be able to make it work. And even though we are in an enviable position, right now, quite frankly, it's never been harder. It has never been harder for us. And I think some of the industry headwinds that we're facing are probably things that many of you all can relate to. You know, the workforce availability and demographic shifts, you know, it's great 
great for our country that we have such high employment rates, right? It's wonderful. As a business, it certainly makes it harder to be able to attract and retain uh, great talent. And if you haven't noticed, there are restaurants popping up all over the place, right? Every corner, there's a new restaurant. So not just the chains that we're competing with, it's all of these new independent restaurants everywhere, where right? More restaurants than there have ever been before. And, you know, we, there's some metrics, uh, th this company, TDN2K, which is, uh, tracks all of the um, uh, recruiting uh, challenges or the recruiting uh, atmosphere for restaurants. The, since they've been doing it and for more than two decades, this is the hardest recruiting time that they've ever had. And attrition is up across the, um, across the whole industry. We also, from a demographic shift, there's just less people who are 18 to 24 right now just because of demographic changes as well. So those largely many times are the people that we're starting to get into our restaurants. The guest and staff expectations, let's face it, everybody wants more and deserves more when they go out for, to eat, right? There's a lot of choices. So the expectations are higher. And uh, guests want to support the employers of choice. I don't know about you, but I do that. When I decide where I'm going to go, not just for restaurants, I want to know that they treat their, pe their people well. If they don't, I don't go back. And I think increasingly that's the expectation for people, not just that they want to have a good experience, but they want to know that they're good employers. Power of social media, we've all seen this, right? One person can change your whole life in social media, right? And the power of that, of social media, really means you need to have your staff members on your side because they're either going to make you or break you. And the growing importance of uh, corporate social responsibility, just like they want to be, they want to know that you're a good employer, they also want to know you're a good person for the community. How is your, what are you doing in sustainability? All of those other things that, you know, frankly, 10, 15 years ago might have been less important. Wage pressures, don't need to tell you about this, but minimum wage increases, particularly in the restaurant industry, California in particular, that is headwinds that we've never, the, the rate of increases is just something that the industry has never, has never had before. And trying to deliver to our guests service and the value they expect while still not cutting back on what you need to deliver those services is incredibly challenging. And frankly, people can go outside of the restaurant industry and outside of any industry and get jobs at higher wages right now. So you have to ha give them a reason to want to stay with you, right? And lastly, the leadership pipeline, which we all know is so critical to make sure that you have the people that want to come to work for you. Well, management across the industry, there's more opportunities, so attrition's up across the industry. So you need to have great pipeline programs and quality of life in the restaurant industry. Let's face it, you work weekends and you work holidays and a lot of people don't want to do that anymore, right? That's just a, that's just a reality we have to face. So we have to make it so that you're willing to not take the job that would give you more of that freedom because you are so attracted to what we have to offer. So how do we do that? For, um, and, and I guess one, one more thing I do want to say is, you know, when you have 200 plus locations, you know, if I ask the server in Thousand Oaks <laughs> what it's like to work at the Cheesecake Factory, they are going to, and then I line cook in Omaha and uh, the, the dishwasher in uh, Orlando. They're going to tell me what it is like to work in their location. They don't know David Overton. They don't know the Corporate Support Center. What they know is what happens in their four walls, right? So we have more than 200 of those locations that we want to make sure everybody has a great experience and that everybody is, has the kind of cheesecake factory experience that, that we're so proud of. And of course, that's really tough to do because depending on the quality of those leaders in that restaurant and all the other factors that create, go into creating that culture, we're either going to hit it or we're not. So it's, that's tough. And also, it's not like our people have, are coming into and sitting behind a desk where I can communicate with them. Frankly, do we want any of our servers or line cooks or anybody pulling out their phone when they're about to be taking your order? No. We don't want phones near anybody when they're on the shift. We want them to be paying attention to what they're doing. Uh, and that means communicating. There's no technology that allows us to communicate with our staff. That's incredibly challenging. Jim, I know you can probably appreciate this as well, right? I mean, that's hard. So what, how do you make the most of those few moments that you have to really create the culture that, that uh, they need uh, while they're on the shift? And of course, we're not Google. We're not going to be able to offer the great financial perks that some of the financial services or some other companies might be able to do. But again, we have to make it so that people want to, want to come to us. At the end of the day, 
our approach to facing this reality is really through our people. And it's all about how we're committed to making this an experience for them that they can be proud of and that they want to be a part of. And our strong culture really does allow us to create, to attract the best in industry. Now, uh, our culture is very strong partly because we know exactly the kind of people that we're looking for. And it has to be people that are tremendously committed to bringing wonderful experiences to the people that come into our restaurant. You've all known the difference between when you go out to eat and somebody throws some food on your table and, and you know, barely checks in with you and everything else, or somebody who can transform the evening for you because of their care and concern and the way they can read what, they, what you need as a guest, right? Because as wonderful as our 250, 300 men, uh, item menu is, it really is just words on a, on a page, or many pages in our, in our case, um, without our amazing people. And as you saw in the video, there's a tremendous amount of care and detail that go into uh, every single day at the Cheesecake Factory. And our staff and, and our managers have to bring that menu to life. And they have to, for example, you know, if a guest says, you know, does that Cajun jambalaya have garlic in it? And can they take that out for me because I'm allergic? They have to know the answers to those questions. And those kinds of questions come up thousands of times a day. And we have to make sure they know the answers to all of those things. That, think about that. That's a lot for them to be able to remember. And they have to care to remember all of those things, right? But that attention to detail, the quick recall, and the vast amount of information that we expect our people uh, to absorb is huge. And we have to know that our people are intrinsically motivated to be able to achieve these standards. We used to, when people came in and they used to do a great job in the interview, and they'd leave the interview, we started saying, Oh my gosh, he's so cheesecake. And we, that was just our shorthand. Or, oh, she's so cheesecake. And then as we started, and, and it was just something we said, and we didn't even really know what we meant by it. And so then we thought about that. And we thought, you know, what is it we mean when we're saying this? Because clearly if we can find more people who are so cheesecake, then that's the key to our success, right? And so we said, really, when we spent some time thinking about it, these are really the reasons, the people that we look for. We look for people that ooze warmth and hospitality. That's something you either have or you don't. We look for people who radiate positive energy. And, and again, that's usually, they come into the job with that. Um, they have to have incredibly high personal standards, a passion for excellence. Again, otherwise you will find our exacting standards crazy making and you will want to leave. <laughs> and they have to love to have fun and celebrate. You know, let's face it, a lot of our guests come in to have fun and celebrate, right? And if our people, it's not in their DNA to, have, to love to do that, they'll think a lot of the things that we do are just silly. But, of course, for us, we think it's foundational. So those are the kinds of people we look for. And again, it's really nice when you can kind of say, know that there's, you're looking for those people because that you can try to attract and make sure that you continually bring in people that fit our standards. So why does this matter? I'd like to show you a video uh, uh, now of some of our So Cheesecake people. Um, we, these are some local people here who uh, we asked to come into our corporate sports center over in Calabasas. And they didn't know exactly what they were doing. But, um, uh, well, I guess I'll just show it to you and, and we can talk afterwards. At the Cheesecake Factory, I'm here to make sure our guests have an unforgettable experience. To help the staff as much as possible, uh, make sure everything runs smooth through the whole restaurant. For me, my purpose was to cook and serve our guests in our restaurant and that's something that drives me every morning and takes me to work. My purpose at the Cheesecake Factory is to take the lessons I've learned over my career in the restaurant business and teach those around me, um, elevate them in their careers, and hopefully elevate myself at the same time, and work for a company with tons of room to grow. My purpose at the Cheesecake Factory is our mission to provide guest satisfaction 100% of the time. We want to create an environment where guests come and they feel welcome, and they feel like guests. We want to be hospitable, and my job is to, at the front desk, smile and welcome them warmly. Bueno, mi propósito cada día es llegar y dejar los problemas afuera de mi trabajo para tener un excelente día y dar lo mejor de mí a los guests que es lo principal por lo que trabajamos que sean felices. We don't advertise, we don't market. Um, a lot of our guests, whether or not they walk back through those doors, is dictated on my performance, my passion for the company, and uh, that's what I try to do. I try to make sure that each and every individual guest that comes here 
if they have any interaction with me, if I serve them, if, I'm, if I uh, take care of them through their experience and their, their dining experience, I want to make sure that they remember me and they want to come back through those doors because of me, because of our great food, because of everybody that it takes to run our restaurant. My purpose at the Cheesecake Factory is to actually inspire the guest with every cheesecake that I actually touch, as well as any other dessert. That's how I communicate with the guest every cheesecake that I give them. I've found purpose within this organization and I feel blessed and I feel like my job is very rewarding, uh, what I do and what I've been able to accomplish in this company. I'm here to be the best person that I can be. I'm here to use the skills that I have and develop them. I'm here to welcome people. so lucky to have those people aren't they absolutely wonderful I mean we you know when you think about it that's the the fact that we have people that care so much that realize the impact that they have for our guests and the fact that we can weave them in to our culture and hopefully make their experience with us so impactful for them personally is something that we never take for granted and again those were those are their words we didn't ask them we didn't tell them any script we just asked them to come in and tell us a little bit more about what their purpose is at the Cheesecake Factory and we have a collective pur purpose uh, at the Cheesecake Factory which is that we nur nurture bodies minds, hearts, and spirits. And our purpose is much more than just words on a page, because we can all see words on a page, put it aside, don't really pay much of attention to it. But we really do a lot more than simply feed people. And we honor all of the good things that happen when people come together over a meal. And I cannot tell you the number of times when I say I work at the Cheesecake Factory. Do you know what kind of response I get? I get people who, whose eyes light up, and they'll either tell me, oh, I love your, you know, 30th anniversary cheesecake, or I love the, you know, the new Skinny Licious menu items that you have, or they'll tell me about the fact that they had their first date with their wife at the Cheesecake Factory 26 years ago, and that they go back every year for their anniversary. We get to be a part of people's lives, and that's incredibly meaningful for, for us. And so for us, making sure that our staff understand all of the aspects of what they do is so critically important to tying everything back together. It's not just food that we provide, but memories. This here is Nicole. She's a server in our Thousand Oaks restaurant. And you know what we do, of course, to start this whole thing off is we have to attract the best people, right? So this is a this is our website. You know, if you go to our website, we're trying to make it as simple as possible. Um, we get a lot of people. We're very fortunate because of our brand recognition. About 80% of the people we hire go directly to our web website. In other words, they know they want to work at the Cheesecake Factory, so they go to our website or they are referred. So 80%, about 20% of our hires are from advertising. That's uh, different than a lot of other companies would have, and it's something, again, we don't take for granted. It's really the strength of our brand that allows us to bring so many people in like that. So we try to give them a bit of a realistic look at what, it what it's like to work at the Cheesecake Factory. And increasingly, what we've started to do is let our staff tell the story. Because let's face it, if you're gonna get a new job, what do you wanna know? You wanna talk to somebody who works at the company, right? If I tell you how great it is, even though if I do my best to tell you how great it is on my, our website, how great it is to work at the Cheesecake Factory, it's like, yeah, 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 right? So increasingly, we've been trying to turn the microphone over to our staff. And that is a little risky, right? It's kind of like, well, it's like Glassdoor. Are you familiar with Glassdoor? You know, a lot of times you go in Glassdoor to find out what it's really like to work at a company, right? Well, now, you know, increasingly what we do is we have a Life at Cheesecake site that basically our staff members can say anything they want on. And so we allow, we put that on, on our website. Basically, you want to know what our people are saying, you go there. Could be. <laughs> You know, that's a little risky. Maybe they wouldn't be saying exactly the words we'd want them to say, but it's more authentic. And so increasingly, I think all companies need to be able to know to do this because they're going to find a way to get to the real truth anyway. So you might as well try, try to make sure that your staff is presenting you in a way that you'd want to have presented. And that is uh, going back to that commitment to your staff to be your brand ambassadors. And that's a huge partnership that you have there, right? And we do encourage them to share it, just so you know, they're never compensated. We never tell people what to say. We just say, you know, go ahead and post anything you want to post. 
We also started a Life at Cheesecake Facebook page, which is public, so you can see it and you can you know, like it or do it. You, know, you can take a look at it if you want. And people on there, they post pe the pride that, that people have, especially a lot of our line cooks, the pride that they have in the, the food that they make and the presentation that they have or the experiences or the fact that they just did something wonderful in their community, they post it all up there and it's great. And you know, again, you have to be a little willing sometimes for people to say things that may not be as artfully said as you would say from the marketing perspective, but it's really important for us to have that and have that authentic authenticity. And so once we get them in the door, and hopefully we're doing all the right things to do that, we really have four things we do to retain them. We try to help them build connections with their teammates from day one. And we'll talk about why that's so absolutely critical. Training and development that ties to our purpose. We have to have recognition programs that are outstanding. And we have to listen to our people's ideas and their innovation and do something with the feedback that they give us. So, the first 60 program is uh, a formal program that we put in place because, again, when you take a look at the restaurant and hospitality industries, there's high turnover in these industries, right? You know, typically you'll have over 100% turnover in, in, in any year if you are in retail space. We, again, in, enjoy lower, I mean, lower attrition, and so we're fortunate in that regard, but we're not immune from the problems of people coming in and leaving quickly. Once we have people for more than 60 days, we end up usually keeping them and keeping them for at least more than a year. And again, of course, some people are coming in for a job during college or whatever else, so there's some natural attrition that may take place, but especially for our kitchen positions, many times they're looking for a career. So when they come in, now picture this, if you're, at, if you're a dishwasher at the Cheesecake Factory, can you think of a harder job than a dishwasher at the Cheesecake Factory? And if you get thrown in and all of a sudden just kind of left your own devices and it never stops, the dishes just keep coming, you know, it's pretty easy for you to think, I could go anywhere else and make as much money. I'm gonna go ahead and do that, right? Though, what can we do to stop that from happening? Well, we put in a formalized program called the First 60, which basically says, day one when you're hired, you come in and you have lunch with our general manager, and they get to know you a little bit. They find out a little bit more, and so they would say, you know, and they, they, they find out what, why did you come to work at the Cheesecake Factory? What is it about it that is, is important to you? Find out a little bit more about your family, whatever it is. Then in, every week we have team meetings. At those team meetings then, it's the general manager's responsibility to say, hey, and we had Vlad start this week, and Vlad is going to school so he can only work in the evenings, but he wants to really be promoted to a prep cook as soon as possible, whatever it is, right? So the other, team, the other managers, the other 10 managers at least know, okay, that's who Vlad is, right? Then that next week, there's his actual work group manager has a week to get to know him even better. And then that next team meeting, well, he's glad is a huge Cubs fan, which puts us at odds, really, but right now. But <laughs> <laughs> or that he has a, you know, he, he's, he's uh, you know, it's really important for him to be able to spend time with his son, whatever it is. But so the next time the man, the other managers see Vlad and don't even have a relationship yet, they can say, hey, you know, how about a game tonight? Or whatever it is, have an immediate connection with him that has a better chance of having them weather the storm that's naturally going to happen the first few weeks and they're here with us. So this first 60 program and these check-ins, these natural touch points, we had to formalize because we could say all day, get to know your people, get to know your people, get to know your people. That's true and of course many people are naturally oriented towards that, but frankly, there's a lot going on in the shifts. So how do we make sure that this becomes more purposeful? And that's one of the reasons that we put this in place and it's been very important for us. As I mentioned earlier, you know, working for the Cheesecake Factory is incredibly challenging. Um, and so one of the things that we did, and I think this, this word cloud here, what this word cloud represents is um, a, a, a verbatim survey responses from our Great Place to Work Trust Index Survey. So if you're familiar with the Fortune 100 process, they work with Great Places to Work, and th this forms two-thirds of the scoring, the survey they do for all of your employees, and one-third is this culture audit. So they give you back at the end of the day, you know, what is it that you're, what words came up the most in that, in the survey, and the feedback that you got. And I love to see, you know, words like family, and great, and you know, uh, people, and team, etc. And I think those are the things that reinforce the connection. It has to be, and I can't tell you how many people will say, it's my second family. And 
we love that. We want to be their second family because we do have to work incredibly hard. Some people also <laughs> say it's like you're in the Marines. <laughs> and that's also because when you go on a shift, everybody is working together and there's nobody that's sitting around. It's not like you have a lot of breaks at the Cheesecake Factory. It's a busy time all the time. And so you, you kind of learn to su support and rely on one another. So we use the term, got your back. It's, I got your back, I got your back. And it's a really big part of who we are and, and what our culture represents. Training, training that connects to our purpose and culture is also incredibly important to us. And so once we hire our So Cheesecake people, um, then we need to take a look at how we can train them the best way and how do we then embed cultural touchstones in that training. So, you know, as a restaurant company, we do have unique challenges when it comes to building a great workplace in terms of not being able to have a lot of time. Like, you can't say, let's call a two-hour meeting. You don't have the luxury of being able to do that, right? So, you have to find times before or after, um, you know, shifts, etc. and when can you bring everybody together? Well, we um, have something called our new menu rest, a new, men new menu rollouts twice a year. And our new menu rollouts allows basically they are what they sound like they're, they're the time twice a year where we put our new dishes you know the, everything that we've decided to put on the menu is about a dozen or so new dishes about twice a year and sometimes we take off some of the things that you know uh, no longer are, are to our guest liking etc and so you know we, we could just have people come in pass out what the new things are and tell them what it is etc um, but that's not what we do we've decided to make this an absolute essential part of, uh, of reinforcing the values that we hold dear. So we make sure it's a party. We make sure when people come in, it's an exclusive tasting. It's a time to celebrate and recognize all of our staff members. You bring 200 people together twice a year and we make it a party. There's, they have competitions, they have games, they, they, we do so many things to make it so much fun. And now people absolutely love these meetings. I would love to pretend it's always been this way. About five years ago, this was not the case. About five years ago, we had, I mean, picture this. You have, let's say you're a server, 23-year-old server. You closed on Friday night. You're, you're tired. And we say, come on, back in, 8 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. We want you to spend some time. They would come on in, and they would sit down and... You know, Beth, best be described as death by PowerPoint, right? We, they would sit down and we would tell them, and this is the new Glam Burger, and it has this on this and this on it. And, you know, can you imagine doing that for two hours? Two hours. I love talking about food. I love seeing pictures of food. But that sounds like a disaster to me. And yet we were asking our people to do that. Clearly, we got the feedback. They were not, not loving it, and we needed to respond to it. And we thought, oh, we're wasting opportunities, really, to make the most of this. And this is, as you talked about earlier, Vlad, you know, how do you make sure you optimize every opportunity to reinforce your culture? It's not just about getting out the new menu items. It's about reinforcing why they're special and how they can come together as a team and how we can reinforce all of the best that they have to offer for us. So our new menu rollouts have have become a really important cultural touchstone for us. This is a picture from one uh, down in San Diego earlier in the year. Um, another thing that is really important to us when we take a look at our um, leadership development training, you know, about 40% of our managers come from staff positions. So, you know, they came, they were a line cook and then they got promoted into a kitchen management position, et cetera. And of course, that takes a lot of training to make sure that they have all the skill sets that they need. And, but we have very intentionally, and, and that's, and we like that, that mix. We like to encourage people to, to uh, start with us and, and make this their career. We also, for the people that do come in externally as managers, we make every single one of them come in as a first level manager. Think about that. Let's say you were a general manager somewhere else and you say, I want to come to work for you at the Cheesecake Factory. And I say, that is so great. Thank you for coming to work for us. You are going to now start as a first level manager and you're going to have to go through everything to get back to the same level you were before. It'll probably take years. Now, that doesn't sound like a brilliant strategy, <laughs> and I understand that. Um, but we, what we found is when we didn't have people start at the very beginning, they didn't get the culture. They didn't understand everything they needed to understand to have the respect of the people in the restaurant and to understand what makes Cheesecake Factory special. So we ended up saying everybody needs to start this way, and ultimately, even at the very top of our um, organization, every single person in operations has started as a first-level manager. 
our, wild, our, our recognition programs. Our recognition programs, um, you know, it's very important, as, as, and it always will be, to recognize people who are doing great things for you. One of the things we do is we have a WOW story program, and the WOW story basically involves a staff member or manager or restaurant team who takes extraordinary uh, uh, measures to be able to WOW a guest or another teammate. And we share these stories across the company and makes because it reinforces all the very best of the people that we have. So so I'll share just real quickly, um, let's see, I'll share one, one uh, from this week. Or, um, okay, so this one, uh, let's see, this letter is to highlight an event that uh, happened during your holiday, or during the holiday season. My name is Janet Evans. I frequent your restaurant quite a bit with your husband, my husband. We usually get the same servers, but during our visit before Christmas, we had a young man named Kyle who had never had it. I'm so grateful that we did. The reason I'm writing is to bring attention to an act that Kyle did, which I safely assume isn't yet known. We, like I mentioned, normally come to part, come as a party of two, but this time brought along our granddaughter, Emma, who is unfortunately battling brain cancer at the age of nine. She is a quiet, shy young girl and is embarrassed by her condition. She feels different than most other kids. The battle to bring up her confidence is almost as tough, tough as the battle against cancer. Long story short, during the meal, Kyle was engaging with Emma, asking her questions like what she wanted for Christmas and what her favorite shows were. He made her smile the entire meal. We don't get to see, we don't see much of that anymore from her. So the meal was finished and it was time for the check, so we asked for it. Kyle was very busy, so we asked him for the bill when he was done talking with some other tables nearby. Kyle told us, happy holidays. I'm taking care of your check for you. I want to make Emma's Christmas very special instead. We could not believe it. I write this to you, to you in hopes that uh, this brings light to an amazing staff member you have working for you. My husband and I estimate that the bill was around $70. For Kyle to spend that on complete strangers during a time of year we sure, we're sure that he has many people to buy presents for is utterly amazing. Please, even if it's against the rules, don't punish Kyle for what he did. Please, <laughs> Please applaud the fact that men and women like this exist in a world with many bad people. Thank you beyond words to Kyle. And I can, I, these stories we hear over and over and over. And you can't, I mean, th these are the kinds of things that make me so incredibly proud. And our people do this all the time. So again, how we can, and, and I have to say, one of the reasons it's so important is because many times our servers and our, our line cooks and everybody else, they don't understand the impact that they have on the guests. They don't know what they were going through in that day. And when they're able to share back and tell us the impact that they has, it is absolutely huge and, and so meaningful to us. One of the most powerful uh, recognition programs, though, that we have is our, uh, our annual Commitment to Excellence Award. So what this represents is every year we ask our uh, managers to nominate who they believe is the strongest or best, their commitment to excellence in each work group. So this is the best busser, dishwasher, server, manager, bartender, you know, host, baker, et cetera, all the different work groups. There's a fierce competition at Cheesecake at the headquarters. We all, they fight, you know, for their people, et cetera. But at the end of the day, there's one that's chosen from each, uh, from each work group. And then at our general manager's conference, we have a black tie uh, dinner, and it is the entire thing is for them. They spend the whole weekend there, but then the whole, that dinner is for them. Many of the times, some of these people haven't ever flown on a plane before, but they come in and their GM gets up and talks about why they are so incredibly special. And I can tell you, there's never a dry eye in the house. These people make us so incredibly proud to be a part of the Cheesecake Factory. And, and again, we hope we can in some small way get across to them what they do for us and that we're just so pleased to have the ability to even work with them. And so again, very powerful for everybody that's involved and everybody absolutely loves this, um, this opportunity for recognition. And lastly, listening to our people's ideas. You know, when you have a staff of 40,000 people, they know better than anybody else what are some great ideas, and you want to make sure you're tapping into that. But it's really hard for us to be able to communicate again, right? So we started something called Cake Talk, which is really a crowdsourcing uh, ability for people, our people, to be able to give us ideas. And then when they give us ideas, other people can vote on them, vote them up, vote them down, you know, that kind of thing. The people that get the most, the things that get the most votes, typically we, we officially make sure that we get back and have some kind of either moving it forward or explain why we can't do it, etc. David Overton, myself, our president, David Gordon, we read every single one of these. So it gets a lot of attention. And it really is an important way for us to be able to maintain uh, a connection with our staff and for them to be able to give us some great ideas that we can act upon.
And some of the ways that then once they give us these great ideas is we can recognize them. We can say, well, here, hey, you know, this great idea is from whoever it gave, we, it gave, whoever gave it to us because we want to make sure we get the recognition out for them making us better. And even some of the new dishes that you'll see on our, you know, menu, they come from ideas and suggestions from our staff members, which is terrific. We'd love to be able to highlight that. And that this is how it comes full circle. You know, because of the constant care and attention that we give uh, to our, our staff and be keeping our culture strong, we've been fortunate, as, as was mentioned earlier, to be named to the Fortune 100 Best Companies to Work For list for the last four consecutive years. And uh, we've also received three additional uh, workplace designations for diversity in 2015, millennials in 2016, and uh, 17, and for women in 27, so best place to work for those groups. And what's the value for us in this? It's huge. I cannot tell you, I mean, I honestly can say more than half of the people that come to work for us will tell us it's because well I know you're a great place to work or I know I saw you on the fortune 100 list and I know it's the same thing with uh, with four seasons because four seasons uh, is the one that has been here forever right I mean on the on the list forever um, it is a huge point of pride for our staff members as well and in in terms of attracting uh, candidates you know we had about 28,000 positions to fill last year and we got 800,000 applicants um, again we still have uh, holes and it's still challenging but we know that a lot of the reason we get that number of applicants is because of the um, branding and and the the fact that people can take comfort that we're going to treat them well so how do we know that it's working I would say one of the best signs of having a highly engaged staff is with the following video that it has been was written and choreographed and directed and produced by some people in our Mall of Georgia restaurant where we um, recently every year we do an annual peanut butter collection drive and so people create on their own these videos and uh, you know frankly who would take the time and the energy to do this unless you were highly motivated highly engaged and uh, so let's take a watch With another, this time about peanut butter Jim Skippy's and that planters, man We even got that Peter Pan Crunchy and smooth if you picky though Bringing it all to your front door Raising the PB, we watch it grow This is that PB, no jelly though uh, Give me what you got, peanut butter drop This that peanut butter, start a new jam For your peanut butter We pound by pound, we lays it down Ain't no time to play around We stacking up, we helping out We really don't like it when we see you suffer Sister, brother, father, mother This peanut butter will be your supper It's time to rediscover If you a creamy or crunchy love it. It's all the same color Protein packing by the numbers, huh? P B P B P B P We getting that P B P B P B P We getting that Got more than 100,000 pounds of peanut butter there that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, that's it. I know. I, I, I think uh, we probably now are transitioning, but I guess I'll turn it back over to you. Unless anybody has any questions or anything that anybody would like to ask at this point. Yes. What do we do for Kyle? You know what we do with our wow, um, the all the wow stories. So if we. You know, lots of times we get these stories, and sometimes we um, we just you know say thank you or whatever else. If they are a wow story like this, so David Gordon, our our president, writes not only writes or sometimes calls them directly and lets them know <laughs> the impact that they had on their guests. And I don't know, to be perfectly honest, I don't know if we paid. Kyle for this to be perfectly honest I don't know about that but typically we'll especially when we find out when people will go above and beyond we do the right thing we make sure that we treat our treat our staff who have gone above and beyond the way you would want them to be treated so I don't know to, to be honest on that exactly that yeah do you know how long have you been at Cheesecake? 10 years 10 years been a great 10 years <laughs> well thank you very much everybody oh, okay.